Welcome to St. Malachy the Actors Chapel for the celebration of Good Friday. O oh Lord, remember your mercies, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ, your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised highly and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to, to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our suffering that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes, we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated and submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to slaughter or a sheep before the shearers, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked, and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses.
a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guard seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was with the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. 
I have always taught in synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged, and the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head, and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, And he said to them, Behold the man! When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to the law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. And when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you know that I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, But the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gavatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! 
Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled, it says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Copus, and Mary of Magda. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine and a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the Spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. And Pilate permitted him. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial clothes along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by the Gospel of the Lord. And so we come to Good Friday, and we hear again the beauty of John's description of the passion, of the death of our Lord. And we begin to think in our lives the sacrifices that we're called upon to make. 
things that we're asked to die to, things we're asked to hand over, to surrender. And from our experience, we find that it's oftentimes very difficult to do so cheerfully, willingly, in a good way. Seldom do we find it to be a Good Friday, or any day, for that matter, when the sacrifice that's demanded of us is great and painful, when it brings about separation or surrender to something that we once knew, that we once enjoyed. We consider, of course, always the, the most tremendous sacrifice we make when we give up a loved one. But there are also sacrifices that happen throughout life. Illness that claims the personality, the joy, the richness of a person that we've loved and known. And as they go through their time of suffering, they begin to let go of the old ways, the ways that were so familiar and so joyful. And they change. They become for us new people. They look the same. They share in many of the same things that we've always done. But something is different. And the Lord knew this. He knew that there would be times in our life where we would have to go through and allow ourselves to let go and let God. And so all throughout life, We've been met with the sufferings, with the sacrifices, and then with the new opportunity to rise, to continue on. It's just that we haven't always wanted or felt that we could accept what God was asking. It took a while to get used to the idea. And for many of us, Sometimes we just never got used to the idea. And it's led to a greater chasm between us and our trust in our God. Well, we don't stop believing, but we just find it hard to accept that we would be asked to do those kinds of things, to let go of people that we've loved, to take on new care and responsibility for them to separate ourselves, to move on, move away, especially in instances where we had to begin a new life for ourselves that we might survive. I think even in this time of pandemic that we've experienced, those people who have had very successful lives, good lives, that have had to uproot and go home or rely on the charity of friends or even strangers that they might survive, that they might indeed rise another day to greet life and its challenges again. These are all part of our experience of this sacred triduum, these gifts of days that help us to focus more and more on God's intimate presence in our life. May we reflect on what it is that we've lost this year. May we bring that to the Lord on the cross this Good Friday. And as we do so and as we surrender, as we let go and let God, may we also recover a sense of trust, trust that will see us through Trust that will begin to reveal the goodness that can come out of sacrifice and surrender. And the trust that comes in allowing the Lord to call us to new life, to rise with him, to rejoice.
Almighty ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church spread throughout all the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their Maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that, by the gift of your grace, all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of catechumens that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity, through Christ our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love of the world through Christ our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord.
Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may, through your gift, be made secure through Christ our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand, through Christ our Lord. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the world. hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us
At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. May the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring me to judgment and condemnation, but through your loving mercy, be for me protection in mind and body and a healing remedy. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.